Joining me now to discuss this are the former Greek finance minister, Yanis Varoufakis, Conservative MP, Jesse Norman, Diane Abbott, the Shadow International Development Secretary, and Alexander Nekrasov, a former Kremlin advisor. Jesse Norman, um, does any of this remotely surprise you? Tragically, no, not really. It's been widely, uh, I think it's been a source of concern for many people who thought about the way in which capitalism has developed, globalization developed over the last few years, that there would be large amounts of money slushing around the international system. And what this does is to share a, is to shed a fairly pitiless light on where but some of it's being deployed. You've written about it. The Prime Minister said he's going to do something about it. And more money is going to be given to HMRC. But it's perfectly obvious that this does not get any smaller with the passing of the years. It gets worse. Well, of course, it's possible. Um, and what I think has actually happened is that the government's actually done quite a lot about it, which is not actually, at the moment, getting the credit that's perhaps due. Um, it's passed the Bribery Act, which was the most stringent act of its kind in 2010. It's passed a general anti-avoidance rule for taxation. It's done a lot of work on preventing money laundering. But you know better than I do. That's not going to stop people evading or avoiding No, no, no absolutely not. The reason for that is because the way in which the financial economy has expanded has dwarfed the effects of nations states to uh, control it and therefore well, what you need is international agreements and much better enforcement. Diane Abbott are we going to get anywhere on this? Well not on the basis that David Cameron is still saying he doesn't think it's fair to call these overseas dependencies tax havens. What else are they? But Jesse's talking about this. But like this it... happened under Labour. Why didn't Labour ever a... shut down on the there's, 13 there's, sovereign... There's a lot we have of sovereignty things. over 13 there's of these tax of havens and have done nothing about Labour it. didn't do. I'm not going to sit here and defend them. But Jesse's talking about this as if it's an abstraction, as if it's victimless activity. One of the consequences of this tax evasion is hundreds of billions of dollars flow out of some of the poorest countries in the world because of the tax evasion, the tax avoidance and rigged tax treaties. People suffer because it's not yeah, just a game. Yeah, but we know game. that. What we it's don't know is game. why you politicians won't do anything about it. Because I think in the past, it's not necessarily true of our current leader, people who are in awe of financial services, they're the people that make the money out of this. Why are the four big four accountants based where? Panama and British Virgin Islands, because there's lots of people who want accountants there. No, because those are centres of tax, eva of tax evasion and tax avoidance. Well, now, uh, what do you make of this? Because obviously the finger's pointing at Mr Putin tonight and he's got a great number of colleagues around him that are named in these papers. Well, I I'm surprised that Putin actually came up because his name is not mentioned in any documents. And to say that he has friends who have offshore accounts, well doesn't really mean anything concerning Putin. But I must tell you something. I had, I'm had, i probably one of the first Russian businessmen in Britain in the 90s. And our Russian businessmen were finding out about offshore accounts in the night, end of the 90s, while your lot has been polishing its offshore skills for about 150 years. So to say that the Russians are misusing offshore accounts when obviously here in Britain and in other Western countries is like part of the deal. Another thing I think that people miss is that uh, if you make your money in the private sector, you can minimize your tax um, uh, liabilities by having an offshore account. But if you are connected to the budget, to the taxpayer's money, or if you're a criminal, that's criminal. So we have to distinguish who is the criminal and who is not. So you think that when we scratch the surface of Panama, it will all be legal? Well, I, I, I don't think it will be legal because Panama is, is a known territory controlled by the CIA very closely. I don't understand who actually opens offshore accounts in Panama. I mean, it's like going to Langley and say, would you keep my money here? It may be legal, but it's still wrong. And the fundamental problem is a lack of transparency. And Cameron has not done enough to force these tax havens to be transparent about who are the beneficial owners okay. of all this money. Yeah, Yanis, I mean, in, in the old days, we used to look at Greeks and the ship owners and the rest of it who paid no tax. And we used to think Greece was the capital of tax evasion and avoidance. Uh, how are you viewing it tonight? <laughs> Well, firstly, I'm exceptionally pleased that there are many uh, of those who have enjoyed not so much uh, tax evasion, but tax immunity, who are having sleepless nights. <laughs> it's a, a wonderful whiff of transparency, even though it may be short-lived, uh, fills me with joy. But at the same time, it fills me with worry that uh, we are focusing too much on a fake sense of surprise. Uh, the only thing that's surprising is that we, we get surprised by this. And we also uh, zoom too much into Panama, the idea of some small island in the Caribbean, when uh, 
Here in the middle of Europe, we have a beggar thy, thy neighbor policy of taxation. Uh, states like Ireland, indeed London, are competing unfairly with uh, other parts of Europe. Uh, we try to steal economic uh, value from one another by offering the, uh, those with ill-gotten gains the opportunity to launder their but, but, money. But, but, but. In London, we have a president of the European Commission who was running a tax haven in the centre of Europe. Uh, yeah, but the, and the, it is important. You're talking about Luxembourg. Of course. <laughs> but you see, the, the, the problem is London is so big, so mm. important in this whole financial services it business, is. quite, a bit, huge, which, quite a bit of which is very questionable, it's a, a very that large it is too payment. big, too big not to have a relationship with. And so you complain mm -hmm. that Europe is, is sort of fosters all this, but they, they have no choice. But I count Britain as part of Europe, don't you? Um, well, you see, of course, <laughs> we're not members of the Euro, and that's the biggest No, but you're element. members of the European Union, and you are uh, as one with us in this uh, race to the bottom, in the beggar thy neighbour policies on tax. Mm. Uh, it's about time we harmonise taxes, especially if we want to have a single market. Well, I do think there's something to be said for that. It's also true that competition in tax can be beneficial because it can force governments to uh, offer cost-effective tax terms to companies and um, that's not necessarily a bad thing. You don't want a situation in which tax is harmonised at a very high level. You want a degree of competition might be beneficial there. I but think what really, you call cost-effective uh, tax... Uh, 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 you've is, had a couple uh, of is, pops, Dan. Just hold on for a second. It's, it's, Let's it's, just, it's if you just allow us... Let me just finish this yeah, point. Just finish the point before you um, interrupt. You've had a couple of good pops on the party political side, but the fact of the matter is that when the oligarchs of Russia were starting to repatriate their money in the 1990s, the Labour government did virtually nothing to prevent that from happening. It did not set any norms or control. Peter Mandelson was famously intensely relaxed about people getting filthy rich. Oh, the tax yeah. gap got very large. The tax gap got steadily smaller. The amount of tax that is collected, always a hard calculation to make, has got steadily smaller. Does it need to go further? Absolutely. One of the things... OK, well, let's just, just get clear this part of a little point, because course. you basically made the point I tried to make to you earlier, which is... None of the parties that have ever been in power in our lifetime, anyway, has ever done anything about this. Unfortunately, too many people in the British political establishment have been in awe of financial services. But what Jesse calls um, cost-effective taxation comes at a price, and the price is paid by ordinary people and people in the global south who are losing all of this money to tax avoidance. No, but, but you but, see... That, but, there's yeah. another point here. A lot of people don't like the way governments spend taxpayers' money. A lot of this money is spent on wars, on vanity projects. It's wasted. So there is a certain protest in this, all of this because people are saying, why should I give that well, money? Uh, Alexander, with respect, no, with respect, no, I, I, no, with I'm respect, saying... surely, what, what a lot of people worry about is what did the Russians do in the 1990s when they started shipping these vast quantities of what belonged to Russia? out of the country, into the well, city of London, tell you what happened, thereby perverting much of I what was going on that. here. I witnessed that. The, the problem was that Western bankers and big consultancies came to Russia and said to these oligarchs, you know what, you can hide your money in the West. And they helped them to do that. Banks closed them the eyes, Western banks, oh, please. And that's amount. true, Jesse? I think there's a high degree of truth about that. I like high degree, but why not just say it's true? Because <laughs> it's always a, a more complex picture than it's described. It's not just about the banks. They were undoubtedly bidding for custom from that part of the world. It's also about the regulation. The regulation was very sloppy and weak at the time, and that's a government responsibility. But there's a shared now, is it? There's a no, shared no, responsibility. Uh, sorry. Uh, you know, the, the, the notion that since 2008, 2009, we have really strengthened regulation uh, is rather vacuous. We have done nothing more than cosmetic changes in order to hide the reality that the political system in throughout Europe, not just in Britain, this is not a party political point, yeah, sure. has utterly and miserably failed to, 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 to deal with this situation. And um, there's nobody you meet that doesn't believe the crisis will dawn again and we'll have another crash. And part of it is about the whole failure to regulate what's coming into London, what's coming into this country, and what's I, coming into I, Europe. I, I think there's a lot of truth in that. I, as you know, have been very prominent in pushing Indeed. for You've the constraints on crony capitalism, and this mm -hmm. is a form of crony capitalism. And it's not just about tax evasion, it's also about money laundering, it's also about corruption. But you've been on the Treasury Select Committee. What happened there? Did they ever talk about it? Well, if you notice what's happened uh, in the last few years, we've had a complete re-regulation of the City of London. The Prime Minister's actually, I think, worked very well and hard to get this up the international agenda. It was the first thing on the agenda of the summit in 2013, tax and transparency, but there is a lack of international consensus, and that does limit the extent to which government of any kind can make a difference. Very that's quickly. a very important point. The Russians invest money into Britain because it's not in the euro. 
You must understand that. You are a victim of your own success. Yes. If you were in the Eurozone, you would see nothing of it. That's the point, and Yanis should th think about that. Last one. We don't need international cooperation to regulate our own overseas territories and crown dependencies. And that's where Cameron is so wrong. He could have done so much more about transparency. I've got to thank you all for very warmly indeed for coming in. And, uh, well, uh, Yanis will be back with us with Jesse Norman later in the programme when we pick over what is wrong with Europe and how can it be solved. Well, Europe isn't just struggling to deal with migration. The region is facing the risk of yet more debt crises, the rise of the far right, the chance of Brexit, and with it, the breakup of the EU itself. And, crucially, are Europe's leaders even able to cope? Just some of the issues raised by the former Greek finance minister, Yanis Varoufakis, in his new book, And the Weak Suffer What They Must, is its title. He joins us again now, along with the Conservative MP, Jesse Norman. His book addresses compassionate conservatism, what it is, why we need it. Yanis Varoufakis, the migration crisis. Now, today, of course, no Syrian refugees left. They were mainly Pakistani and people not from that particular conflict. But do you justify what's happening? Well, the problem with this uh, European Union fudge or <clears throat> agreement, call it what you might, is that firstly, it's uh, inefficient. Secondly, it's illegal. It violates basic principles of the United Nations, of international law. We don't have the right to deport refugees or people who are seeking refuge without processing, without looking at their cases, finding out, and especially not to deport them to a country that has not subscribed to basic uh, international law on refugees and human rights. Where Turkey. does this fit into your extraordinary and, and mm -hmm. revealing, I think, deconstruction of exactly what is wrong with Europe? The refugee crisis and the migration crisis came to sit on top of uh, an economic collapse, an economic disintegration, which is the result of the hubris of past decades when we tried to create an economic system that uh, was simply not fit to purpose. It was not never designed to sustain the, er the, sh the, the shock waves of the earthquake of 2008. Uh, so from 2008 onwards, there's been a comedy of errors. Every time the a European Union uh, uh, great leaders meet in council meetings, in Eurogroup meetings, in Econfin meetings, one error follows the other. And uh, the only thing that really uh, concentrates the mind of our leaders is how can they be in denial? How can they pretend that the rules which are, cannot be enforced are being enforced? So the, the result is terrible economic outcomes which have created centrifugal forces by, within Europe. We see toxic political powers gain prominence. We see the, the Greeks right. hating the, the Germans, the Germans hating the Greeks, everybody hating the French, the British wanting to leave. Uh, this is the result of a postmodern 1930s kind of disintegration. So and then you add the refugees on top of that, and what well, should be a manageable you... problem is becoming unmanageable and leads to this kind of organized misanthropy. Well, that, that, that takes us to the number of the thing that basically the project has failed. This aspect of it. I don't think there's any doubt that the combination of the Eurozone crisis and the tremendous uh, catastrophe of the centre of the European economy um, has pushed the capacity of governments to and the European Commission to manage events to the limit, and to have this on top has pushed it beyond it. And that's why we're seeing um, so much difficulty going on uh, uh, on both sides. I think what's so interesting is that you know, they had the opportunity in some respects to crack the Greek issue when Yanis was the Minister of Finance, and they backed off. And that, I think it was a crucial moment, because it now feels to me, and has done for a year or so, that the result, and you must comment on this, Yanis, is, is going to be another bailout of Greece, another round of extend and pretend. And I just wonder if that's really doable, and whether or not, when it, the whole thing comes down, if it does come down, it won't bring down not just the Greek economy, but the Eurozone and possibly a large chunk of the German economy. But, but I think the, the, the other point that you make is that actually, if we left, let's forget Greece for a moment, mm -hmm. if Britain left, it would so profoundly change Europe that it might itself implode. Well, Greece is the canary in the mine. It's not responsible for the methane gas explosion, but it is an early warning and it should be used as an early warning system. Instead, Europe is in denial mm. of the problem that Greece manifests, just manifests, on the question of Britain. I think that the great error that both sides in this referendum debate make is they assume the European Union is something out there, a constant, a given. And then the 
question that the British public is asked to decide upon is whether you want to be part of it or not. Mm. It's not so. The European Union is an evolving uh, enterprise and a disintegrating one. Brexit would profoundly affect this disintegration process. I think it would accelerate it. And simply by hiding behind a reconstituted sovereignty here in Britain, you are not going to be able to escape this vortex which will be created in the center of the continent if, let's say, the euro splits. The European Union disintegrates completely as a result of Brexit. Brexit speeds it up. You're going to end up with a huge dividing line, a new Berlin Wall, this time between uh, France and Germany, uh, running down the, the Rhine and across the Alps. The Germanic lands, anything east of, of the Rhine, are, are going to become deflationary because of the new Deutschmark that we'll appreciate. The rest of Europe is going to be stagflationary with a combination of high inflation and high... Well, and Do you think that Britain is going to be unaffected by this? That you will be able to sail across the Atlantic into some wonderful alliance with the United States well, okay, and China? But in which case, You're going to be dragged into this. But both of you are critics of the great enterprise. What, what's to be done about it? Because your fundamental issue, or the fundamental in this book, is that actually the structures of Europe just don't work. Yes, but the difficulty has been that, as, as Yanis has eloquently pointed out, at every moment when the canary has been singing about the methane gas that's about to engulf the whole thing, people have just ignored it and therefore have failed to deal with it. And I suppose one of the things that people who support Brexit, and as you know, I've been scrupulously neutral on this issue because I'm looking after my constituents. You're um, the first on, neutral on I've met. Well, uh, that's because I think my constituents deserve impartial advice and uh, information. But um, I you do... You still have to cast a vote in the end. And that's a private matter for me, thank you, John, but I'll leave that to my constituents. Um, the question is not that. The question is how we as a country can... Um, whether or not Brexit is itself then the action that forces the Eurozone and the other European countries to take a grip of the situation. That's the other way of thinking about it. It would be catastrophic it... for us. How European could a grip Democrats be taken? need Britain. But if that is How true, yes, that, if that's true what, how... what would you have to see to make this thing work, make Europe work? Well, the first thing that we need is a large dose of transparency in Brussels. I have a very simple view. We're agreed on that, my friend. If we live stream European Union Council meetings, mm -hmm. just, just that, I mean, there are cameras in there, connect them to the sure. internet so that people can actually see what David Cameron argues on their behalf, what Tsipras, Merkel, Hollande argue on behalf of their people. Do you know what difference that would make? I have, have, I've had this traumatic experience for five months in Europe. Mm -hmm. I can assure you, John, Jesse, that if you could see live what was going on in there, the conversations would become far more rational mm -hmm. and the outcomes would be far better for everyone. So that's just one step. The second thing we need, we need some serious rethink of economic policy. At the level of the European Central Bank, we need more and better coordination between the Central Bank of Europe and the Bank of England. We need to have an investment bank like the European Investment Bank having branches here in Britain with quantitative easing that purchases investment bank bonds that go straight into new technologies in Britain, in France, in, 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 in Greece and so on to crowd in private investments. We need to rethink uh, the way in which we manage welfare, social mm -hmm. welfare throughout Europe, uh, without any federal moves, just in order to increase the sovereignty okay. of our national parliaments. Let me ask you as a, a final first step. Yes, no question. Yes. If you were British, would you vote to stay or to leave? To stay in order to fight Brussels from within. <laughs> and can I ask you, <laughs> no, which, which is, which, do you think there will be another bailout of Greece as matters presently stand? There is every, every second month there is. We, we're because this is what happens there. when you have an unsustainable debt. You need more unsustainable debt to pretend yeah. that this, the previous debt was sustainable. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll never close this down, but thank you very much indeed for coming in, Jesse Norman, too.